I'm going to pass you over to Dr. Margaret Steele. Dr. Margaret Steele is going to pose a very uh, interesting question. So she's going to ask, is obesity a disease? So without further ado, take it away, Margaret. Thanks, Kaylee, And thanks, Chris. That was really interesting. Um, let me just share my slides with you. And because um, I've been teaching intro to ethics and stuff like that for years, and it's got to the point where I basically can't talk without slides, which is terrible, but that's where we are. So yeah, is obesity a disease? Um, spoiler alert, I'm gonna say I'm not sure. Um, it's the topic of my master's thesis for um, the master's in obesity, as Kaylee mentioned. Um, and it's also kind of the reason I'm doing the master's in a way because um, I did my PhD in philosophy on the relationship between weight and health. And predictably enough for a philosophy PhD, it kind of raised more questions than it answered. And I kind of hoped that learning a bit more about the science of obesity would answer the questions. Um, it turns out scientists are not much better at giving direct answers than philosophers, but the differences are interesting and it's been a fascinating journey for me. So I just I don't know the answer yet, but I hope you'll enjoy hearing a little bit about the question and where I've got to with it. Um, so, I mean, it's also kind of personal for me because I'm a person who's always struggled with my weight, even though I don't really feel it as a struggle now. But um, luckily for me, I was born in 1980. So just around the time I was born, Western culture figured out how to deal with weight issues which is basically everyone just eat less and move more and we can all be thin right yay it's fixed um not quite that simple um personally dieting certainly didn't work for me trying to eat less and move more didn't work for me it also as we now know very well didn't really work at a population level um you know that in all the time that we've been telling people to eat less and move more the, pre the prevalence of overweight and obesity has continued to rise. So it's pretty much a failed strategy. Um, and yet it seems to be the one that continues to be pursued. Um, so part of, I suppose part of the reason it doesn't work is because eating less and moving more is effectively starvation and our bodies are really good at resisting starvation. And there is quite a long pedigree of research on this going back to uh, one of the most famous kind of landmark studies was this um, starvation study conducted in at the end of World War II. Um, so basically this approach doesn't work because our bodies are really good at fighting starvation and the kinds of bodies that we're typically told need to lose weight tend also to be bodies that are especially good at resisting starvation. Um, I wanted to find a photograph illustrating twin studies from the early 90s. I couldn't find anything. So I went with um, a shot from Sister Sister, which is about twins reared apart in the early 90s. So, you know, close enough. Um, and also, I suppose, around the same time that this research was emerging, it was kind of the golden age of genetics the research, right? Um, you know, for a while, it kind of seemed like we might be able to find one specific obesity gene in humans or maybe something similar to the OBOB gene in mice. Um, and one of the things I've learned, having started to learn about science, um, it turns out that lab mice are kind of like Vegas in the sense that um, sometimes what happens in mice stays in mice. And this is one of those instances where we found the relevant gene in mice it hasn't really appeared in humans so i suppose the situation we're in is kind of that um we know obesity is very heritable but we don't know fully what exactly it is that is inherited um there are medical treatments and while all this work on genetics was being done you also had Kind of in parallel there's very good advances in bariatric medicine um i was happy to find that medics and scientists also really love randomly using greek and latin terms for things so that was very comforting for me coming from a philosophy background um 
And in bariatric medicine, we've seen a lot of sort of leaps forward. Like recently, you might've heard about the drug semaglutide. That's been a big kind of game changer, or they're saying it's going to be a game changer. But the, a lot of the practitioners and patient groups really started to push this idea that obesity is in and of itself a disease. Um, and in a lot of cases, what happened was it kind of started to be treated as a disease de facto. So it wasn't that people sat down and had a conversation saying, you know, what are the criteria of disease that we agree on and does obesity meet these criteria? It was more, uh, yeah, sure, people can, um, people can write off this treatment on their tax return or, oh yeah, sure, we, we'll, we'll monitor claims about weight loss on drugs, you know, the, the FDA in the US. The, the USA really kind of led the charge on this, perhaps not surprisingly, because they were the first country to really start dealing with a skyrocketing prevalence of overweight and obesity. Um, and in 2013, the AMA, the American Medical Association, um, voted to declare obesity a disease. Now, interestingly, they actually had a subcommittee examine the question and the subcommittee came back with the recommendation that it was not a disease, that obesity did not meet the criteria. It, did, it didn't have a defined etiology, so it shouldn't be counted as a disease. However, when it was opened up to all the delegates or whatever, whatever their terminology is in the AMA, they voted to say that it was a disease. And I think that must have been largely on the grounds of pragmatic reasons, but I don't know. Um, I suppose for me at that time, I was writing my PhD dissertation and I found it strange when I read the news about the AMA, I found it strange, first of all, that people that so many millions of people were being categorized as, as diseased purely on the basis of their body size. Um, and I also found it strange that it was being done on pragmatic grounds and without necessarily a grounding in what even is a disease. Now, there isn't anything like a consensus on what counts as a disease in any field that I've looked at. So there certainly isn't a consensus in philosophy. There isn't a consensus in epidemiology or in, you know, in any branch of science, you'll get multiple um, definitions. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about philosophical de definitions because those are the ones that I know the best. Um, and you could think of philosophical definitions of disease as being on a spectrum. And you could imagine one extreme being this, this guy called Christopher Bourse, and Bourse has been incredibly influential. So in the 70s, he propounded this theory that disease is purely a biostatistical concept or that it can be expressed in purely biostatistical terms. And you could think of that as being at one extreme. And then you have at the opposite extreme, you could put a few different people in here, but maybe just to take a real kind of extreme, let's say Michel Foucault, um, who would argue something like disease is, you know, there aren't natural categories of disease. Disease is a term or a category that we apply to kind of say that we don't like something, basically, that it's culturally unacceptable or disvalued or something like that. So you have one group of people saying disease is purely an objective, factual issue. Some people saying it's purely a value issue. And then you have all kinds of theories in between. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to focus on Bourse because his is very much the dominant theory. It's like you kind of either have to agree with Bourse or you have to explain why he's wrong. Um, and that's partly because his account of disease is very intuitive. It matches the idea that a lot of lay people would have of disease, I think. Um, so the key thing about Bourse's concept is that it's supposed to be value free. He says it's naturalist. So it's, it's like a scientific point of view. Um, and that means, so what he means is when we say X is a disease, so something, um, obesity or whatever, we're making a purely factual statement. We're not saying we don't like X or X is unpleasant or harmful or anything like that. We're just saying if X is present in a body, that body is functioning below the statistically normal range for that species for it's he says it's reference class so like species age and sex there can be different categories in play at different times 
um, some part or system of the body is not doing its job. It's not contributing to the survival of the organism in a statistically normal way for that type of organism. Does obesity match that? I mean, it's a, obviously a complicated question. Um, I think it depends on how we define obesity. Um, if we define obesity strictly in terms of excess adipose tissue, so you know, high BMI can be used as a proxy for that. We know it's not a great proxy, but you know, it's kind of one, it's a handy one, it's easy to calculate or whatever. Um, if we think about it that way, I think it's kind of problematic because it seems like, um, well, it seems to me as a kind of a newbie to the whole science and, and medical research aspect, it seems to me that accumulating body fat is kind of normal, like storing excess energy intake in your fat cells is one of the ways the body functions. That is species typical and that is a normal range. Now, I don't think that answers the question, right? That's not a conclusive answer. Um, I think there are different definitions of obesity. Um, but I suppose, yeah, the other point is there's this idea of metabolically healthy obesity. Um, part of the reason I wanted to study the science of obesity was because I figured if there are such things as metabolically healthy obese people, so people that have an unusually high level of adipose tissue or fat, but are otherwise metabolically healthy, well, then that would have to mean that obesity, at least defined in terms of BMI, isn't a disease. Um, unfortunately, it turns out, as usual, the scientific answer is it's complicated, it's controversial, people disagree. So I didn't get the nice, clean answer that I was hoping for. But... Um, one way that people have kind of got around this or my objections or my the kind of concerns that I've expressed, which are not original or unique to me, um, is to say something like this, that overweight and obesity are abnormal or excessive fat accumulation that may impair health. And I've seen it argued that um, if you add that caveat about um, impairing health, that that is enough to 